Hi, thank you so very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For those of you who were in the plenary presentation by Lorianne uh, Farrell, um, how inspiring was that? Um, I, it was truly inspiring. Um, there are aspects of what she spoke about that I hope um, this panel will highlight, especially when we're talking about trusting the community. Um, I am joined this afternoon by an exciting group of people. Um, directly to my right is Kay Baja. Uh, we all call her Baja. <laughs> 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 She's just come in and so full of energy. I've known Baja for uh, more than three years. Mm -hmm. Um, she goes by the pronoun uh, she, key, and uh, she truly is an energy rooted in empathy, love, and compassion. Um, she expresses that all the time. She coaches, facilitates, and leads workshops, retreats, and trainings that nurture heart-centered self and collective liberation while supporting deeper connectivity to nature's genius and shifting of power. Those are a lot of words that basically mean people. People, people, people. Baja is the originator of the Resilient Hub Resilience Hub concept and has been working on Resilience Hubs for over a decade throughout North America and internationally. Um, she most recently served as a senior director of um, direct support and innovation with the USDN and was also the climate resilience planner and floodplain manager with the city of Baltimore. In 2016, she was recognized by the Obama administration as a champion of change for her work on climate and equity. And then it's her work with Resilience Hubs that I came to know Baja. She educated me. <laughs> um, I, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> 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 Dr. Estelle Marie Montgomery, I'm executive director at the F.H. Fontroy Community Enrichment um, Center and um, located in Ward 7, Washington, D.C. What is significant about this community-based organization is that we are rolling out the first in DC's Community Resilience Hub. And that work is being made, has been made possible through the community and also the leadership from Baja. Next to Baja, we have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sonia Burbacher. <laughs> Um, she is the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami, um, also serving as the Director of the Office of Resilience and Sustainability. She's responsible for leading resilience expertise across the municipality to effectively address climate change challenges. In her role, Sonia implements actions to reach the city's carbon neutral, coastal resilience, and extreme heat goals. Just a few things, <laughs> okay? Um, that therefore, her work centers around adaptation initiatives, mitigation initiatives, justice initiatives. These initiatives move towards the city's goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Mm, all right. Just yes. a, you know, just little a little things. thing just that you got to do, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> um, and then we have Dr. Michael Pardis. Did I say that correctly? You got it right. All right. <laughs> He's the executive director of Red Hook Initiative. Yeah. Um, as an anthropologist and educator, he has a deep understanding of the historic and social roots of injustices faced by Red Hook community, by the Red Hook community. Michael most recently was the executive director of the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, a nonprofit focused on community health building. We are looking forward to hearing your views on all the topics we're going to be touching on because of your in-depth understanding and intersectionality between systemic injustices and community resilience. So without further ado, we're going to kick off the session with answering that question that I always get in my role. What is a resilience hub? <laughs> all right. Baja, please. Should we talk about it? Let's talk about it. All right. So a resilience hub is a physical structure. It's a building. It's not a movable car. It's not a green space. It's a physical structure, first and foremost. And it is rooted and anchored in a neighborhood. And it reflects the specific character and unique needs of that neighborhood. 
What I'll say about the structure itself is it is most often, if you think about the best community space, the absolute best you could ever think of, design, managed, people are there, they're feeling super safe, super welcome, it is like they're home away from home. That is a resilience hub. The thing that makes it different, different than the best community center you can ever think of is that it's also augmented to be able to withstand disruptions. The biggest thing I'll say about resilience hubs um, that I've found to be disheartening over the last decade is that um, folks who are finding this as something that they just used to uh, replace the words emergency management or emergency shelter. It is not that. Resilience hubs are meant to serve the community all year all year long because we need to be resilient all the time. They're meant to be spaces for social cohesion, for connectivity, for bringing people together. Um, and I mentioned safety and belonging. That's the key to a resilience hub. So when we hear people center the hazards over the humans, that's not what this concept is. We are centering the human needs, the human capacity, the human connectivity over the hazards and then retrofitting those sites to make sure that they can also withstand those dis disruptions. Um, because we've seen in so many disruptions, right, that social cohesion and connectivity is the most important thing for how community members are going to survive and thrive. Um, and also, if people are going to a place that they trust and belong to, they're more likely to go back all the time. Um, so it's not just a pop-up shelter, it's not just a pop-up thing, it's actually there consistently all the time. I can talk about Resilience Hubs for about 20 hours straight though without breathing because I have been doing it for so long. So I just want to check, does anybody have a question about that definition? Yeah, yeah, Justin. So the fact that being it's a multi-faceted, like multi-use kind of community center more so, it's like more focused around being a community hub and less focused around, you know, being called an emergency shelter? 100%, it is, it I would say it was 98% community hub, community space, community center, and then the 2% of the time we're actually in some state of disruption, it has everything it potentially needs to be able to handle that disruption, to keep the lights on, to have information flowing, to have people know where to go, to distribute resources. But one of the other key things I'll say is it can't just be a place to put solar and battery back up on a building and call it a resilience hub because that wouldn't have done anything for us with our most recent long-term disaster such as COVID, right? So we in, we're thinking, I. I intentionally say disruption so that we don't center again just these hazards that we talk about a lot in these spaces. Sonia, I'd love to hear your perspective. <laughs> from yes, 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 and it, and it has evolved. <laughs> it has it has evolved for sure. So um, in Miami, yeah, yeah. Actually, let's go to the first one. Yeah, let's go to the first. I'm gonna slide. skip through mine. Okay. I'll come back to mine. Okay. So in Miami, the need for resilience hubs was really highlighted um, when Hurricane Irma hit in, in 2019. Um, and it showed that you know in some parts of our city, particularly lower income parts, it took longer for electricity and the power to be turned back on. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a real problem a after a disaster. It's, um, hurricanes usually happen when it's hot. <laughs> and so if you don't have power um, for a sustained period of time, you know, that, 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 that brings into, you know, a lot of issues that kind of go beyond uh, the disaster that, that, that just hit. Um, and so, you know, people really needed a place to be able to access AC, as well as electrical outlets for their phone. Uh, we use our phones you know, for news every single day. And so when there are the disaster hits and then you don't have access to you know, what's going on, you know, w when, when help is coming, when w you know, w what everything else looks like around you, that's, that's pretty scary. Um, so one of the areas um, that, that we saw that this, was happen that this happened in was Liberty City. Um, and so, you know, it was a major reason why we decided for our first resilience hub to be in Liberty City um, at the Charles Hadley Park, um, it, which is a very heavily utilized park. Um, in, in Miami, um, neighborhoods you know, are very distinct. There are neighborhood parks and um, they serve as community centers. People, pe people go to the parks. Um, and so we, you know, looked at this building 
Um, there's a new build kind of beside it um, that that um, that built a new kind of athletic center. And so, but the community center part, you know, where people go every single day, um, you know, is is an existing building. Um, and so we said, hey, we really want to rehabilitate um, this facility um, and make this, you know, resilience hub. So we we want to um, we want to add a, a, a generator. Uh, we want to add additional electrical outlets. We want to expand the Wi-Fi that even goes kind of outside. Um, and we want to add um, impact windows and doors that actually withstand a Hurricane 5 um, hurricane. Now, when Hurricane, no, fives, you know, you know, people you know, are, are supposed to um, leave. But we also know that, um, you know, there are areas in the city where people don't have access to cars. And so, you know, there's there's the reality kind of of that. And so, but we, so we want to make sure that there are places um, that that people can go. And so we actually got um, a HUD CDBG disaster grant um, that at that time um, uh, would cover all this expense. But now that some years have gone by, there you know there's a lot of inflation and construction costs have increased. Um, and so we've actually put up um, kind of additional funds uh, to, to, to make this happen. Um, but when I say that, you know, it's evolved is that, you know, we were thinking of this as, you know, uh, a, 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 you know, a place that people can go after a disaster because it is also a point of distribution where, you know, where we do have emergency management come in and give ice and food. Um, and so, you know, we're like, okay, we, we, we do want this to be, you know, our first place kind of in the city where, where people can go in a disaster. But like you mentioned, you know, this, wh why just think of this for when a disaster hits? You know, we don't want a disaster to hit. We want to be prepared and we are very prepared. Um, but, you know, this is, this is, you know, people here every day and we want this to be every day. And so, um, unfortunately, uh, recently, every day, especially in the spring and summer, is very hot in Miami. And so last year, we, um, we experienced a lot of extreme heat. I, I talked a little bit about that this morning. Um, and, you know, we're also looking for our resilience hubs to be um, cooling centers as well so that they, they can be used every day. And um, we've developed a draft heat season plan um, and some of the actions are kind of like of what the city is doing um, and it is in our parks kind of extending pool hours um, and, and having people have access to AC so so it's something that we that we are thinking about in our resilience hubs um, and and this is this isn't just the first one we want them kind of throughout the city um, a one mile radius where every resident in the city can walk to um, and so we have to be, you know, really thoughtful that um, we're, we're putting these in areas that are above uh, sea level because uh, the average, um, average elevation in the city of Miami is six feet <laughs> above sea level. Um, and so we have a lot of places that are actually uh, less than two or three feet. Um, and so we, you know, we, we want to make sure that, that we have them in areas that, um, that can sustain that disaster. Thanks. Michael. Resilience hubs, when you get asked that question. So resiliency hubs for us were not, um, it was not what we were charged to do. And I say that because emer I'm talking to a crowd that knows emergency, um, disaster, right? Those things are emergent by definition. And we're a community-based organization that has programming for youth development, civic development, leadership development. We didn't expect to become a, resil a resiliency hub. But in fact, what happened was when Hurricane Sandy hit on October 29th, 2012, we happened to be on a block at 767 Hicks Avenue in Red Hook that didn't flood. Could be because our building was formerly a garage Perhaps that's what did it. Perhaps there's some fate or some higher being or something that didn't allow this one particular block to flood. Um, but we didn't. And so, because of the social infrastructure that we had created, uh, that social cohesion that we had created, that social network that had existed, we became, by, by definition and example, a place of trust. Mm -hmm. By definition and example, we became a place that was a credible messenger. And we became a place as a resiliency hub to do some of the things mentioned 
How do you think about sustainability? How do you think about resilience? Um, material hardship that happens in those type of crises, like batteries, a place where you could charge your cell phone, a place where you could find out when the next um, emergency drop-off is gonna happen. So it became a site of emergency where the 6,500 residents of the Red Hook houses who were trapped in elevators, who were trying to find their cars on their side of the block, waist-high water, we became a place where the material hardship could be solved. We also came to be a place where healing would happen, okay. where people would know they're not alone, even if they haven't heard from an important family member or a friend or even a neighbor in a few days. They came to the Red Hook Initiative at 767 Hicks Avenue because it was one place where, yeah, they could get um, material things that they needed and information, but where they could be reaffirmed in their humanity, they're not alone. They are not alone in what they witnessed, right, due to this uh, planning and uh, planning failure and then a uh, corresponding um, emergency response, that they're not alone in what they witnessed, and that allows them to be more resilient. That they are not alone in what they experience in the, in the pain and the difficulty of being without water, gas, power, that they're not <laughs> alone. But it is not only a, a narrative or a story of suffering. Right, the resiliency hub where the social infrastructure of trust and cohesion happened. It was not just a place where material hardship was solved, information was shared, nor a place of misery. What happened after October 29th, 2012, was that this became also a site for getting, as we would say in the industry, upstream, right? It became a site for process improvement and planning improvement. It became a site of imagination it became a site where the resilience of a community of people, primarily the 65.2% African American, oh, sorry, black community that lived there, that came in the 1960s uh, at the tail end of the second great migration and thought they were settling into an industrial maritime economy that slowly withered away. And then they saw a disinvestment. And then they saw the compound social um, of harm of not only disinvestment, but poor planning by being bisected from the remaining parts of Brooklyn, like Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, Red, um, pardon, Park Slope. So then the compounding factor of that happens. And then the compounding factor of a drug ep epidemic. And then the compounding factor of a prison um, to school pipeline, an school to prison pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. They had been resilient in face of all those things. And now, as climate change becomes real, not only do they come to a place that has supported that work and they become, and they come to a place where they trust, where there's credible messengers, where there's cohesion, where there's material hardship and information solved, but they come to get upstream and dare to imagine. Because now they also have to become, and this wasn't in my uh, job description either, but <laughs> civil engineers <laughs> of a yeah. sort, emergency planners mm -hmm. of a sort, um, and they have to figure it out. It, but, but the imagination part is, so how do we do this better and what else can exist? How do we do this better and what else can exist? And so not only as a resiliency hub do we facilitate some of the nuts and bolts of like write down five names and numbers on a piece of paper, keep an emergency bag packed with re rechargeable, uh, thank you to the engineers and, and the folks that do the material, physical world things, um, renewable, a renewable battery source and uh, a list of names and numbers that you need and a change of clothes and a plastic, a re a reuse, upcycle uh, bag of plastic that allows it to be circular. Not only do they come to learn those things, and not only do they come to learn how to advocate so that way NYCHA can be fully funded and the resiliency and sustainability plan can be implemented. Not only do they come together to go up to Albany, New York to do those things, but they come to dare to imagine that while it is inevitable that we will be uh, even greater risk of flood, that we dare that the next time it happens, there will not be people trapped in elevators for over 12 hours. Mm -hmm. There will not be people that can't find their car because it's flooded to beyond waste level. That it won't be people that are without power for weeks because the power grid was shut down. And it won't be that. And so the resiliency hub is not only for survival and a recognition of those that could survive, but for the 6,500 residents of the Red Hook houses east and west at 767 Higgs Avenue when they come to the Red Hook Initiative in co 
coalition with other stakeholders in, in the ecosystem. It is a place where we dream and dare and begin to plan for something more than that and something better and different. And so for us, that's what resiliency hubs means in the material and in the uh, qualitative. Thanks so much, Michael. I'm going to talk about um, the Fauntleroy Center, really from the same spirit of what you've just laid down. So I'm going to ask the audience a couple of questions. How many of you have been to Washington, D.C.? How many of you know what east of the river means? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, is, what, what are the communities considered east of the river? Where are they often referred to? Okay, what wards are represented east of the river? Okay, so well you're from DC. Okay, I'm asking these questions because I have been gifted this project. And the plenary speaker said let's get personal, so we're gonna get personal just a little bit. My career prior to becoming executive director of the Fauntleroy Center was in the private sector. I had an international career transforming organizations, leading investments and capacity building, really, really fancy stuff. And the founder of the community-based organization, the Fauntleroy Center, named after his grandfather, approached me because prior to COVID hitting, um, the center was bestowed the honor of being selected DC's first resilience hub. Well, nobody knew what a resilience hub was. I mean, what's a resilience hub? What does that mean? And the community, and we'll talk a little bit more about the role of the community um, in this process, but the community took, took the lead. The community was trusted to take the lead by the Department of Environment and en Energy, NDC. The community said, you don't know what we need. We know what we need. And so the Fauntleroy Center was the location for these co conversations. And the output from these conversations, and Baja was brought in, output of this conversation was, yes, the Fauntleroy Center has been selected to become a community resilience hub. And then COVID hit. And then Dr. Montgomery got a phone call. I said, Ward 7, DC, I know DC. I've been going to D.C. I'm not from D.C., but I've been going to visit family in D.C. since the 80s. And I thought Capitol Hill, there's a wall that's right behind Capitol Hill. I thought that wall was the end of D.C. I didn't know that on the other side of the Anacostia River are two additional communities. There are a total of eight wards in D.C. And there's Ward 7 and there's Ward 8. They happen to be 99.9% .9 African American. They happen to be the poorest. They happen to suffer every, s the worst of every socioeconomic indicator, poor infrastructure, but guess what is also there? The source of the amazing history of Washington, D.C. These are the folks that built and serviced everything that everyone understands about Washington, D.C. And this is when it became personal to me. Because whilst I was very familiar with equity at the corporate level and the international level, I had no idea that right there in Washington, D.C., there was this other complex project that was about to take hold. So the Fauntleroy Center was also providing for almost you know, 10 years programming on a regular basis intergenerationally to the youth, to the adult, to the senior population, augmenting, right? So it was a location that was trusted. And so when COVID hit, for us it wasn't the flooding, even though we are in a flood zone, but when COVID hit, and everything shut down in D.C., and yes, the death rate was the highest in that part of D.C. Our board said, well, I, I realize we have to shut down for programming, but the community depends on us. So what are we gonna do? That's when I was actually called in, because I'm a fixer. <laughs> 
hey, Doc, wh 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 what can we do? It's like, well, what have you been doing? And what does the community need? And so if you go on our website, you'll see a, a video where I talk about this. But that was, you know, beginning of COVID, there were no face masks available, food shortage, et cetera, et cetera. So the long and short of it is looking at the blueprint that the community had defined and assessing the needs as a result of COVID, we became a resilience hub immediately. We answered the call of the disruption. We did our best to provide necessary materials, necessary food, and we even started testing hybrid programming because we had no idea how long this was gonna go on. So we did some virtual programming with our youth and with our seniors. Can we give everybody some of the information on the foundation that you used real quick? Yeah. I think like that, we don't have that yet. Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna go in here. Yeah, I just right. wanted to build on that. <laughs> so for us, when, when folks are asking me about what is a resilience hub, like what Michael was saying, it's, it's really, we are a center that deals with daily disruptions, right? We have, we have stressors every day, okay? The daily stressors, sorry. And then you have your serious disruption, whether it's the flooding, the power outage, and so on and so forth. And like what Baja was saying, my challenge always as I talk to external key stakeholders, partners, is the importance of making sure that the community is being served every day, that we are providing programming that uplifts and enriches the community every day. And we prepare the community for the major disruptions. So emergency readiness and preparedness is definitely a cornerstone of our programming. So what I was going to lead into <laughs> was about, um, I wanna talk about program design the importance of um, operations manual, mm. okay, and uh, lessons learned, but I also want to circle back to the issue of trust and build upon that further. So in terms of the blueprint um, and building yeah. up I think a resilience hub. I'll have to apologize. I think we got a little bit of, it, we are so excited about our resilience hubs. We maybe got a little bit ahead of ourselves as far as not giving um, some of the, the scaffolding, essentially, of like what they include. One of the things that I will mention is there are what we call kind of foundational areas or core components, and there are five of them. And this is so, again, we don't get into the situation where somebody decides they want to come to Puerto Rico, put solar panels on a building, and call it a resilience hub, which we saw happen lots of times after Hurricane Maria, so just saying. Um, so the five foundational areas are something that we kind of make uh, – critical for every site. They didn't get my slides in, but I'll send them to you all afterwards. The first one is programs and services. And that is just all the great stuff you're hearing that Michael's been talking about, that Dr. Estelle's been talking about, the things that are happening every day. But we're not thinking about them just in our like every day. We call it different modes, so our everyday mode. We're also thinking about how do those programs and services change when we get into a disruption, and how do they change when we're going through recovery? So think about it like a little grid system or a matrix, if you will. We have our everyday mode, which we're in 98% of the time, our disruption mode, which we're in about 2% of the time. Recovery kind of goes along with that, but it can extend. And then you have your five sort of foundational areas, programs and services, Communication and information is a huge one. Building and landscape is the third. The fourth is certainly the power systems. I'm not gonna say that part's not important. And then as Dr. Stell said, the operations and maintenance. Because there is no way any of this is gonna work if we're not thinking about the operations of a site and the maintenance of a site especially. So those five foundational areas are really critical. What I wanna emphasize though is not every site has got to get to 100% of every single one of them, right? And so that is what Dr. Estelle was just talking about. They went from not believing they were a resilience hub to believing overnight that they were a resilience hub because they realized they had all kinds of capacity to be able to do information, to communicate, to bring people in and utilize the building a certain way. So of those foundational areas, they had three of them that were really elevated and two that were still sort of lacking, but they were working towards them. Um, I'm sure Mike will talk about some of the other ones that are happening in Red Hook as well, but you know, when you're in different modes, those things change. So I just wanted to mention that 
this is something where it's phased in over time. We don't try to have the most perfect resilience hub because if we do that, we delay the ability to actually serve the community, to do the things. So um, I will mention one other thing that's not gonna be really popular, but I do it every time, so here it is. Um, the best resilience hubs are actually owned, managed, and run by the community and the community-based organizations. And I know that I have a lovely local government person here next to me that I really, really <laughs> enjoy and like, who's trying to do everything they can in a position that they're in to also um, to do that. But just to remember that the reason that the resilience hubs exist in the first place is because we have intentionally marginalized and disenfranchised communities in this country from the very beginning of when the establishment 400 years ago, yada, yada, yada. That's being said, um, these are not intended to be in every community. They're not intended to be prioritized in the areas where people can already handle things on their own because they've had multi-generational wealth and access. So when we're talking about resilience hubs, they need to have the funding, the resources, and the capacity prioritized in the neighborhoods that have been intentionally disenfranchised and intentionally marginalized. All right, I'm gonna okay. get off my freaking soapbox. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, um, I want to go to trust and um, and then we'll circle back in terms of <laughs> in terms of um, you know um, stakeholders and uh, multi pronged funding and so forth. Michael, um, how do you view trust? And then Sonia, I want to hear it from you because mm -hmm. you said it's ever evolving, right? Yeah. And you know we throw trust out there. Um, but Michael, I wanted to get your perspective in terms of, as a CBO, the work that's involved, mm. right? Because from coming in from the outside, what I recognize is that there's a lot of mistrust with anything government related, okay? So we're having to constantly reinforce and make sure we don't overpromise. If you could just talk about that in terms of your work. And Sonia, when you said it's ever evolving, I'm just wondering the role of trust mm -hmm. in that evolution that you are experiencing, mm -hmm. Michael. So one thing about our community is that we learned about how to respond to climate or weather-based emergencies or um, disasters because we have been dealing with a socioeconomic set of disasters, pandemics, and crises. And what that looks like is simple things like, I'm in rent arrears, I've been sending the checks, they say they're not receiving the payment. Or we've called 10 times for the elevator to be fixed, it doesn't get fixed. Or the amount of time it takes to respond to um, a 911 call that's a medical emergency is higher than the city average. How do we get it faster? So when our community has constantly been dealing with those epidemics and pandemics of being underserved or asymmetrically um, 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 protected, it's been a community level response, a CBO, community based organization, a nonprofit. It's been the local uh, social network that has responded. And so, what that often looks like is when crisis happens, a nonprofit looks like a 311, 911. Then we look like the EMS that comes, and sometimes we're post op, right? To get there and like, what happens next? We do all those things. The crisis happens. The lights went out on X Street. This happened on Y Street. This happened in this building. We're 911. Can you help? We're 311. Oh, sorry. Really New York centric thing. Sorry. 911. <laughs> no, no, Miami, Miami has that too. Okay. 911. Cool. <laughs> uh, it's an emergency. Like, I, like I need help. Or 311. I've been trying to get someone to respond to this and they haven't. So we receive it. Okay. Here's what we're going to do come or this or that. Then, so then we're like EMS, right? We got the complaint, we come, we're the emergency response. We come and we help figure it out. Is it a policy issue, an advocacy issue, legislative? Is it like technical? Is it technology-based, like a fax machine you don't have? Is it a notary? What, what is the thing? So then we solve that, and then we're the emergency room. Then we solve that piece, and then there's the post-op, there's the follow-up. Did it actually get solved? Is, it con is the root cause being addressed? So a little nonprofit, a little community-based organization, that's what they do. But why are they seen by the community as a 911 slash 311, as an EMS, as an emergency room, as a post-op? Because we've helped them solve those problems mm -hmm. before. 
it because we've helped point them in the right direction before. Because we provided the care infrastructure for the anxiety and the stress that is escalating by not being responded to or being ignored or being delayed because there's a care and an empathy, right? Mm -hmm. That subtle touch, that reassurance, that follow-up. And so we have trust. And so now when there's a big emergency that happens, they come to us, right? The second thing that's small is um, at the time of Sandy, for example, our um, employment, our staff was probably 80% local, like from this neighborhood. Challenges and positives to that, but the type of cohesion that existed by just empowering local people, compensating from their, compensating, pardon, compensating them for their work, training them, upskilling them and or training them so that they could be able to do this those are inputs that every capacity building, professional development, we all know that. But that is your cousin. Mm -hmm. That is the person that you went to elementary school with. That it's the person that you sit in the park with in the summer because it's too warm inside your apartment and you can't afford to have AC, but you can sit outside and hope that you catch a breeze. And you have that experience over several years. I know that person. And that person will be accountable because if they don't follow up, I'm going to see them in the park or I'm going to see them next door or I'm going to see them at Food Bazaar or I'm going to see them wherever. And again, it's challenging. It's not perfect, right? There are like many challenges to have that level of proximity, right, to people. But there's also a tremendous power in times of emergency, in times of crisis, in times of disaster. And further, there's a greater solidarity and dependability that we hope to channel it into to take that trust and that knowing and be able to lift that into um, upstream solutions. And so that trust from we've solved this before, we've helped you before, because we've been responsive with care, and that it's local people who we believe in you so much that we train you, prepare you, upskill you for you to respond, that's a model that a resiliency have as much technical experience. I want to send them to all the scholarship programs, colleges, everything else. And you know, maybe there's a donation you can make or a par strategic <laughs> partnership to me, right? For the civil engineering, resiliency, all the uh, urban planning, all the things we need. But we've been many those things and teaching ourselves and learning by doing for quite some time. And so that history and that kind of ecosystem that lives and feeds into itself represents trust and then represents solution making and survival. Thank you so much, Michael, because you know, we have a, a slogan now, just to make it clear to everyone. Mm. It's excellent by, with, and for the community. Mm -hmm. I like From that the one. community. Mm -hmm. So you can take it. No problem. <laughs> we share. share. We share. We share. We share. I've already one. gotten the warning that it's Q&A time, but Sonia, if you can just give it. Yes. You know, Michael took yeah. all your time. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, just a minute of just your perspective on trust. And that yes. Yes. So, um, so from a municipality's point of view, trust is so important because often we don't have any. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we know that it's really important to, um, to, to, to try to gain that. And, and frankly, you know, we, we gain it by working with community-based organizations. Um, and so, you know, Miami is pretty early in, in the stages of resilience hubs. And it's, you know, it's, I, it's pain to me to say that because I know that we've been thinking about this for years, you know, and really from a municipal standpoint, you know, we're like, okay, where, where are the places gonna be? Um, and and, and l l let's get the locations down, let's get what's needed. And then you know, th then we're going to talk about programming, and so that's um, you know that that's kind of where where our process is, um, because you know we 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 feel that you know it's important to acknowledge where disenfranchisement has happened and to correct it. And so the way to do that is for the city to be involved and to say, hey, these are facilities that the communities use and that, that we can then put some investment into it. But, you know, at the same time, you know, we, we have to use community-based organizations. Uh, you know, even just with our regular work and kind of you know, in, in doing outreach, um, you know, in, in Miami, you know, 60 percent of the residents are, are foreign born. And so even the communication, like almost everything, you know, I do and putting out kind of, you know, through, you know, virtually or social media is in three languages, 
English, Spanish, Haitian Creole. But there are so many people in the city that do not look at social media, <laughs> you know, do, do not look at the website and the, 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 the ways that we communicate. And we're never going to have enough resources or people or any of it to be able to get into the neighborhoods because a lot of the information that um, the that is that 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 residents would like how it's conveyed is face to face um, and by mouth, right. and 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 oftentimes it is at our parks, it is at our community centers, but it's, it's not also, and so you know there there is a need for you know funding for community based organizations, which our city you know often often does, but you know it just got me thinking of more of the evolution, Plaja. And you know, when I'm thinking about programming, um, Sonia, I'm going to interrupt you. Okay. Um, because we all have to hold ourselves back. Uh, <laughs> we can all talk about this for 20 hours. I just got the 10 minutes until the end of the session and I wanted to offer um, the room the opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, yes. Um, I'm, I was really excited for your workshop because like I read a lot of progress and improvement on your mm. workshop, so thank you for doing mm -hmm. it. Um, so my question was, you talked a lot about community, well you guys talked a lot about community engagement, so what sort of um, facilitation or um, workshops y'all have worked to derive like community building solutions? If that makes sense. Yeah. You have to do you want to do it? Okay. So, um, Again, I, I wouldn't use the exact same workshop with any um, one community. Like they have to um, reflect the community that they serve, and so I think a lot of times um, there's a difference in the way I would approach something in Baltimore versus the way I would approach it in Hawaii. Um, in Baltimore, we went and sat on people's stoops. We went and actually went into barber shops. We went and spent time in places where people are going to be vulnerable and open and wanting to share information. Um, and then we had them ask or invite us in to say when would be a time we could come and do this a little bit more um, formally and get some ideas and get some thoughts together. In Hawaii, they do something called talk story where they all gather at some, um, they call them uh, auntie or an uncle's house and um, everybody sits around and it's all around food and sharing of culture and, and then you can kind of facilitate and go through. So um, I give those two examples because I do think it's really important for anything where you're gonna be really engaging with people to reflect the, the culture, the neighborhood and, and the specifics. Um, one of the things I did mention in the very beginning though that it works really well if you're trying to get ideas is to look at um, those five foundational areas and the three modes and get people to start to think about what the uses are at the site in each one of them. Put themselves into that sort of um, place of, okay, it's a really sunny day and um, there's no big disruption. What do we want the site to have? And that's when people start to talk about tool shares or I would like to not own my own chainsaw, but I want there to be a chainsaw class where I can learn and then come check one out. Um, there's a lot around economic development, uh, youth programming, senior programming. Uh, but then when we get into a disruption mode and we're saying, okay, in the middle of a disruption, what things would you need? That's when we start to identify different, uh, you know, I need somebody to come up and check on my grandmother because she's living by herself. Uh, we need to have these types of resources. We need this type of communication. So it provides some structure so you can go through and start to actually put it up on a big wall if you want and have people fill it in. Um, however you like, if you're a big post-it note fan, this is also a, a way to use your post-it notes that you have. Um, but it's an interactive way to work with folks. Oh, wow, okay. I see a hand here, I see a hand. I think we have time for about three more questions. So I'll take yours and then the other two back there. Um, this question's directed to you, Sonia. Mm -hmm. um, I know we talked about kind of the difficulties with adopting it when it's coming from the municipality with the resiliency centers but what has it been like with that pilot location? Has it been adopted by the community? And if not, what efforts do you think need to happen, especially with how difficult it is to get people to check media? Yeah, yeah, so, so even though we're, we're pretty early, we've, um, we already, even a, over a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, we, we engaged um, the Liberty City Neighborhood Association. You know, it's, it's their neighborhood. Um, and so we were saying, hey, this is the idea, you know, how does this sound? Is, is there additional things? Um, but, you know, we, we have to engage, um, you know, we have to find, like, a, as we think about our programming, um, it, it, none of it's going to be like, oh, hey, this is what we came up with. Um, what do you guys think? It's going to be like, no, what do you need?
Yeah, I think it's a really good point, and um, I know Dr. Stahl is going to want to answer this too, so what I'll just briefly say so she can is um, that a lot of times when we're talking with um, people in federal government, state government, and local government, they think of disruption as the natural disasters or the um, big threats that happen with uh, human-made violence, guns, other things like that. Uh, when we're talking with community, it's an entirely different percentage. And with community, disruption feels like all, almost all the time, um, especially in places where you have power that's out all the time or it's hot all the time or other things like that. So I use those percentages in um, fancy spaces and rooms like this. And I think they change when you're working with community to say like disruption's real, it's all the time. It's not something that you're away from, um, but we want to plan for your life thriving in that time. Yeah, there's a term. That's why we don't yeah. put the resources into the natural disasters and stuff. We put the resources into the programs, the services, the everyday needs, the things. So it's it's where are you putting the percentage of time and capacity? And what we find to be the mis idea around this is that people think we're just doing something for Hurricane Maria or doing something for a such and such flood. We don't want that. We're talking about the everyday stressors, the everyday uh, disruptions, and that's why those program services, communications, other things are huge priorities. You're 100% right. I just wanted to show this. I, I wasn't going to show this, but I think this captures it. Um, we are addressing, um, earlier I said disruption, I meant stressors. There's a terminology called blue sky that's often used. When you are in the communities that need these resilience hubs, stressors every day right, that, feel, that can feel like a disruption in other communities. So when you look on the um, left side, the goal of building resilience and creating sustainability, the community is centered in that. We have programming, and if you notice, one of those bubbles is about disaster, emergency, readiness, and preparedness. That's the disruption, that 2% that you're thinking about, but three quarters of programming, but in fact, funding-wise and effort-wise in the center is about all of those other areas that will give us the impact of building community capacity, personal agency, something that we really need to restore, mm -hmm. right? And addre by addressing the stressors and, and, and also educating the community on how to manage disruptions, right? And those percentages are just that. Okay, as a resilience hub, we are meeting people where they are every single day. And we're not worried about which part of the percentage they fall under. That's right. Okay. Good question. Very good question. The gentleman, yes. Uh, this, will, this, this will be the last question. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I promised him. No, so this <laughs> is the last question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we, we should. And I think going back to the, the keynote lecture of the afternoon, mm -hmm. really specifically, right, it's about power. And that power manifests itself, not just in voice. Like, yes, we need feedback to improve um, process improvement, response improvement. But the power shifting is also who holds the ultimate decision-making rights and recognizing that technical knowledge by degree certification, et cetera, has to match experiential knowledge, which is I've survived this and done things to get past it before. When the decision making becomes more balanced, not just the voice, then we'll see a change. But if we're in engagement, voice, and then you other ones decide, I think we're in a doom cycle of like inadequate, um, unculturally responsive um, responses and systems. 
Thank you all very much. Um, this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.